I'm Australian. I'm Oliver G. I've been in Paris for about six years. And uh, I just uh, want to tell you a little bit about my life here and what I do and hopefully share some fun and funny stories to keep you entertained. But it will be in English. And I can promise a smattering of French, uh, but uh, it's going to be an English talk. So before we get anywhere into anything at all, just by a show of hands, the people with the video on, I'm just going to ask you a few quick questions just to know whether, I, you know, I'm repeating myself or anything here. Like, how many of you guys are quite familiar already with who I am and what I do? Like, if you're quite familiar, wave your hand so I can see. Okay, so Alan and Dorothy and Camille. Okay, and if you've got no idea uh, at all who I am or what I do, wave to me now. Okay, great. Okay, this is my favorite kind of audience. And unfortunately, it looks like we lost Peggy, but I don't think she wanted to be here anyway. So uh, I think that's all right. Um, look, here's the, here's the background on who I am. I'm a, I moved to Paris in 2015 uh, to be a journalist. And as I think you guys all probably remember, 2015 in Paris was, it was a very difficult year for the Parisians and for France. That was when there were the terror attacks. Um, like a lot of them over that one year. And I came to work here as a journalist to cover, you know, this horrible time. And uh, it was a very serious time and a very serious bunch of, you know, things that were happening in the country. And I'm not a very serious person. Uh, and so it didn't really suit me, to be honest, but it gave me a really good deep dive into France, French culture, how the country works, uh, the language, you know, working in a French office. And I did that for two years. And, uh, and then I moved on to starting a podcast and writing books, which is what we're sort of most going to talk about today. Um, but while I'm still doing the introduction, after I, uh, after I was a journalist for two years, I started making a podcast on the side. It got popular. And now I'm very uh, fortunate that it's one of the top travel podcasts in the known universe. And uh, it's a career for me now. I don't do any journalism anymore. And, uh, and along the way, I wrote a book about my life here. And very recently, I wrote a children's book with my wife, who's an illustrator. And uh, it's set in Paris as well. So now you guys all have a pretty good, uh, sort of a pretty good understanding of who I am and what I do. Um, now I sort of want to just try and entertain you and answer your questions about Paris and sort of tell the story of how I got to where I am today and uh, share Paris secrets, that kind of stuff. But also um, a, a large part of what I do is doing live videos where I walk around Paris interacting with the, the people who are watching live. And with that in mind, it's actually a lot more fun uh, for me if you guys have questions or if there's something you want to know or you want to know a little bit deeper, if you put it in the comment thread and then I can read it and interact with you guys. Otherwise, you could just as well be watching this video as a replay in the future. You know, like we're all here together, so let's make it fun is what I think. All right, so what I want to tell you is the story of how I got to be a, a, a secret finding podcaster in Paris and how it happened and how I turned it into a job because I think it's a pretty cool story. And then I want to tell you some of the crazy secret stories that I found along the way that I'm sure, especially you guys who've never heard of me before, will find uh, wildly entertaining and will be ending up telling your friends about. Uh, but let me start with this story of how I became a podcaster because it's pretty fun is uh, I was doing the journal journalism gig and it was, uh, as I said, it was pretty tough. It was pretty, pretty heavy, not really for me. When I got this opportunity to go and join this uh, community radio station, they were looking for volunteers. They said, do you want to, some guy said to me, do you want to host a show? And I said, yep, let's do it. I'm going to call it the Eiffel Tower, which is a, a play on words for the Eiffel Tower. You listen to it with your ears. And just out of, as a show of hands, you guys who don't know me, do you listen to podcasts at all? Wave your hand if you do. Yeah, okay. And the other people, not so much. That's great. Okay, so a podcast is basically like a, a radio show you can listen to whenever you want. And uh, so I went to this show and started recording it. And my idea was to do a radio show every week where I interview an interesting Parisian. This is four years ago now, right? And uh, I had no clue what I was doing, no training. I just call up people who I think a lot of you guys, uh, if you're following sort of Paris channels, will have heard of, you know, famous chefs, famous authors, uh, even, um, you know, bloggers, just anyone who'd want to talk to me. And I did this show on the side while still working nine to five. And I really enjoyed it. 
Um, but obviously I didn't earn a cent from it. So it was kind of just a side gig until one day I was, uh, it was, it, this is a story that changed my life, really. I was in a coffee shop in the Marais. It's called Le Peloton. But, so I was in this coffee shop and uh, ordering coffee in English because it's owned by a New Zealand guy and an American, actually. And uh, I get the coffees and it's for my, uh, she was my, just my girlfriend at the time and a friend. And I turn around holding these coffees and this guy, like, it looked like he'd been struck. I'm not exaggerating this because this changed my life the way this happened. He looked like he'd been hit by lightning and he, and he stands up and he goes, you're Oliver G. And I said, I said, yeah, yeah, I am. I was like, I was quite taken aback. I was like, yeah. And he goes, um, I love your radio show. I listen to every single episode. Uh, I love it. I just love it. And then he sang the jingle that I used to have. And this, this like I didn't even really understand that anyone was listening to it at the time at all he was he was beside himself uh with excitement turning to his friends he goes this is Oliver I've told you about him and they were all looking pretty unimpressed but I couldn't believe I couldn't believe there was this guy that that actually listened to every episode so I walk out uh with the coffee and I sit down uh with with uh, the woman who'd become my wife and the friend and we were all sort of laughing and they were nudging me, you know, oh, your, your little side gig is, you know, someone listens to it. And as we're sitting there and I'm feeling pretty good about myself within maybe like 30 seconds, there was a woman and she was from America. Actually, I don't know where she was from in America, but I'm going to, uh, I said, I'd try and entertain you. So I'll try and do an American accent. Uh, as I remember this, uh, this, this woman spoke, <laughs> she was across the road and she looked at me and she went, Oh my God, you're Oliver G. And she ran across the road and she said, I've, am I, does it sound American? I don't know. She goes, I have booked everything you recommended. I went to every, that's the reason I'm at this cafe. I've done every tour. I bought every, like I'm losing it. She said that she'd done everything that I'd recommended on the show. And uh, she just said hello and went and bought a coffee and disappeared. And it was at that moment that I realized that there was some kind of little, you know, glimmer of opportunity in this okay. sort of silly little radio show that I was doing. You know, people weren't just listening, but they were using it as a guide to Paris. And pretty stupidly, to be quite honest with you all, uh, I decided then and there that I wasn't going to do my job as a journalist anymore, even though it was a, you know, full-time paying gig, a sensible job uh, that I'd been doing for a couple of years. I uh, handed in my resignation really quickly and decided to, not like straight away, I thought about it a little bit, and I was like, no, I can smell the opportunity. I'm going to try and uh, uh, make a go of it. And my logic was, if that one woman, like if that one young guy liked the show, and if that one woman from abroad had paid money on things I'd recommended, I was like, there has to be a career in there. So I went from a salary to literally a, a zero. I started at zero and, uh, and I uh, worked to make the podcast a show. And if you fast forward to four years to today, uh, there are something there's around 70, it gets about 70,000 downloads a month. And I think as you wrote in the introduction, Camille, the, the New York Times just recommended this show. And uh, it's my career. I don't do any journalism anymore. And I don't know if that sounds like a, like a um, wild ride when I say it out loud, but for me, it was uh, really incredible. So uh, that's, how I fell into this job and that's how I keep doing it. And for every Monday since then, I've put out an episode uh, with someone who I think is interesting, just a half an hour, me chatting with someone who I think is interesting, letting them tell their story. And I've done it every Monday for the past four years. And uh, as I've been doing them, and these are kind of some of the stories and secrets that I wanted to share with you. As I've been doing these over the years, I, uh, I, I'm getting a sort of, I like to get quite experimentative and uh, in, in the kind of different people that I interview. So at the start, I'd interview, like, like I said, like a fame, they didn't even have to be famous, like a blogger with a lot of followers or an author or a celebrity chef or anyone who I thought could help me make the show grow. But as it, as uh, I started experimenting a bit more, I would, you know, look for interesting stories rather than people who had following. So I remember once one of my favorite that I've ever done, uh, I was lost in the Marais down there near St. Paul and I was talking to, to my wife who's Swedish and I was like, I don't know where the road is. It could be here. It could be here. And this elderly man came up 
And he said, oh, I hear you. You've been speaking English there. Are you lost? Can I help you? And I told him we, what I was looking for. And we got chatting. And I said, you know, so why are you speaking English here? Where are you from? And he turned out he was from England. And he'd been living in Paris as an expat for, for 50 or 55 years or something. And I thought, that is the kind of story that I want to hear. You know, it doesn't have to be an author selling a book. Someone who's lived here for 50 years surely has some interesting perspective on the city. So uh, I told him I'd like to interview him. And I went to his house, which was this fantastic old, you know, half timbered house. And we just talked about what it was like being an expat uh, when he moved here to today. And uh, it was so lovely because, you know, like if someone's written a book or whatever, they're going to try and promote it. This guy had nothing to promote, just conversation. And then at the end, I, I sent him a text message and said, did you get to listen to the show? He said, I don't have the internet. How am I going to listen to it? So I went and met him and we sat at a little cafe, outdoor cafe uh, on the Seine. And uh, I, I had my laptop and I put it there <laughs> and he sat there listening to it like this. And he was just sitting there agreeing with himself every couple of minutes. He like, he'd go, yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. And these kind of uh, opportunities that I've had to meet these people, you know, it's not all flashy and fantastic. Sometimes it's just typical man off the street has been uh, wonderful. And that's some of the story that I'm going to get into now, but I'm just going to dip into the comments to make sure I haven't lost any of you guys uh, yet. Not really across, not really says Sandy. I think she's talking about whether I did a good American accent. Not really across between New York and the South. How is that not really? I think that's uh, that's perfect. That's someone whose mom's from uh, New York and whose dad's from the South, no? Uh, Dorothy says, hi, Oliver. Just started watching your videos on YouTube when you and Jay Swanson were walking, I believe, north to south through Paris. How long did this take? That's an easy one to answer. Um, it took as long as the video lasted because we did it live. So I think the video was four hours long. So what Dorothy's referring to is something I'll get into in a second. Is uh, Like I said, I do a lot of live videos. Uh, which is how I turned a free podcast into a, a job, which I'll tell you about in a second. But I put, I basically get a stabilizer, which means that your phone doesn't shake. And I walk around, usually into interviewing people and put it on YouTube. And uh, one of the things I did is I walked from the very southernmost tip of Paris on the periphery to the very northern one. And I did the same from the uh, east to the west. And it takes, I think it takes about four hours to do each and one of them I'm going to do soon, in fact, I, I put it out as a promise to people, is when the YouTube channel gets 10,000 subscribers, which is getting pretty close to, I'll do the same thing uh, along the Seine. So from the far eastern edge of the Seine all the way to the western edge through Paris, I'm going to do that. I'm really looking forward to it. But it, it takes it out of you because like it's kind of like now, this chat we're going to be talking for an hour, and it's, it's kind of not that hard to talk for an hour. Uh, but when you do it for four hours while walking, while looking out for traffic, trying not to step in anything that a dog might have left behind, uh, it kind of kills you. And we made the mistake of doing the one south to north uh, through Paris means you're going uphill all the way to Montmartre. Uh, but anyway, Karine says, are you on YouTube or podcast or both? Where is Karine? I want to see who I'm talking to. There you are, Karine. I'm on everything. I bet if you search on any of these channels, you'll find me. Podcast is the main thing. YouTube is kind of like, I say it's like a, like an octopus with eight arms, you know, maybe eight, I don't know, maybe more, but you know, YouTube, podcast, Facebook, Instagram, books, uh, Patreon, there's all these different ones. And I kind of try and grow them all at the same speed because like if tomorrow, um, well, there's two reasons. I know there's people here watching who have no idea what a podcast is and who are never going to listen to one. Uh, and I, you know, I still think I'd like to talk to you kind of people. So, you know, the YouTube channel is just as uh, worth checking out. And so the books or for example, whatever. So uh, it's a bit everywhere. And I think it's kind of whatever kind of person you are is the one that you should seek out. Uh, and keep sending those questions because I like answering them live. I'll tell the story. I'll tell you a fun story now about, I'd say probably the favorite uh, episode that I ever made. And it's, and unless you guys know me kind of well, it's a story that you definitely haven't heard before. And, uh, and it's part of what I think one of, what a, I think one of the big problems with Paris and all these uh, tour guides and Instagrammers and YouTubers and stuff, and I'm guilty of it too sometimes, is, is a lot of people are just rehashing the same stories over and over and over and over again. You know, so like if you've ever done one of those really average tours in Paris where there's like, 60 people following one tour guide and they're telling those same jokes and you can see where the joke is coming from and they 
you know, like they have a 30 second anecdote about, you know, this Louis, the sun king or something. I think there's a lot of that. I think that's a bit of a problem. So I'm always trying to find new stories in this city, stories that haven't been told before. And here's one, like I said, one of my favorite. Uh, so in the early days of the podcast, I was, uh, I was down by the Canal Saint-Martin, which is the canal that runs through sort of Eastern Paris. And it's sort of popular with hipsters. And I was, uh, it's not really relevant to the story, but maybe that's why I was there. Maybe I was a hipster when I was sitting there a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sitting there and a few of us were sitting on the edge of the canal having a picnic, a few people having a beer. And I looked into the water and I saw like a largish animal swimming around. And uh, for context, I'm from Australia where there are a lot of exotic animals uh, around. You, I don't know what it's like in uh, Westchester, but in Australia, you, you see kangaroos, you see snakes, you see all sorts of stuff. And in Paris, the only thing you see are pigeons and rats, basically, and, and pet dogs. And uh, when I saw something swimming in the canal, I, not exactly, I got super excited. And I was like, you know, when you see a really excited dog, I was like that. And I was trying to follow this thing and figure what it was. And it was kind of dark, so you couldn't really tell. Uh, and the closer I got to it, like it was much bigger than a rat, but it looked like a rat, smaller than a dog, looked like a dog. The closer I got, uh, the more I followed it, I was convinced it was a beaver, like a big beaver swimming in the canal. So I start uh, researching this. Do beavers uh, exist in France? Uh, do they come down as far as Paris, if they do, or up as far as Paris? And, uh, and I talked to a lot of my friends about it. I was really obsessed by it. And it was super divisive. Like a lot of people, like a lot of people were like, don't be ridiculous, there's no beaver in there. And then other people were like, hey, maybe there's a beaver, who knows? So I thought, instead of uh, just interviewing some author this week, why don't I do a kind of episode where I try and figure out if there's a beaver swimming in this canal, could it be possible? So uh, I, I went down there with a microphone and I start interviewing everybody around. I see some of you are smiling because I think I know, I think some of you know where the story is going. The rest of you look like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Bear with me. I'm down there and I'm interviewing people. Hey, have you seen a beaver? And uh, half of them say yes, half of them say no. One guy said he'd seen a body in there. He'd heard there was a body, which I didn't really believe. Uh, but there were all these stories coming and it was this fun kind of conspiracy sort of episode. Uh, and it was going along pretty well until uh, the last uh, interview that I did the day of the day is uh, I saw an older woman sitting looking quite wistfully over the canal uh, and just, just really peaceful just sitting there. And uh, she was a French woman. I walked up and I sat next to her and I said, excuse me, madame, est-ce que vous parlez anglais? Because obviously the show that I record is in English. And uh, if I did in French, a lot of people would probably be disappointed, much like, was it Peggy at the start of this show? Uh, I didn't want to disappoint people. And so uh, she says, yeah, I speak English. She spoke perfect English. And this that I'm about to recount to you, you can listen to it because it's recorded and it's, uh, I've heard it so many times that I'm giving you a very accurate uh, representation of how this went. I said to her, I went in, I went in gentle. I was like, so do you like the canal? And she said, why, yes. Uh, why, yes, I'm sitting here. I sit here all the time looking out over the water. And she pointed to a few things. And uh, I said to her, listen, do you think... Uh, I said, do you think it's possible that there are animals swimming in the, in the canal? Uh, Alan asked if it's a beaver. Oh, Alan, you're in for a treat. Where's Alan? There you are. Uh, so I said, um, I said, do you think there are animals? And she says, why, yes, there's ducks, there's, there's seagulls, there are pigeons. And I said, yeah, but other animals, perhaps. I said, do you think? And I, and I said, do you think there's a beaver in here? And she said, she said, why, yes, of course there could be a beaver in here. And then she paused for a second, looked out as if she was deciding whether to tell me something or not. And then she said, there are crocodiles in here too. And I said, I, I was much I was much like uh, Murray. Murray, whose last name is Beaver, amazing. Murray uh, and the woman beside him. I was like, yeah, okay, what, crocodiles? And I had a million questions, but luckily I was recording it. So I asked her all the questions. I said, what do you mean there are crocodiles in here? And she said, why? There are two crocodiles in here. I said, how do you know? She says, I released them two years ago. And I said, what, what, whoa, 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 what do you mean you released two crocodiles two years? And I, just like I am now, I got, I got really 
I was incredulous, but interested. And I had, I just kept asking questions. And it turns out, I think she'd, I think she'd uh, bought the crocodiles from a pet shop when they were little or something like that. And they got too big for uh, her fish tank. And she snuck down in the middle of the night and let them go uh, sort of right where the 10th becomes the 11th hour in this month. I asked all the questions, all the details, and I thought she was sort of, uh, I sort of fact-checked her because they'd recently dredged the canal, but it was right after they dredged it. So uh, <laughs> so I kept asking these questions, what, you know, and the story took me, I'm remembering this now, as I said, the story took me to, uh, I, I, so the whole beaver podcast episode changed drastically. Now it was a crocodile one. So I'm starting to chase this crocodile story, and I went to the local mayor of the district, and I interviewed him and you can listen, to, I should link this to you at the end, you can listen to it. I said to him, uh, do you think it's true there could be crocodiles swimming around in Paris? You know, and they, two years on, they're not gonna be this big anymore. And uh, he was really fun and we had a good chat with it. But then uh, at the end of it, he goes, it's like 1982 all over again. And I said, what happened in 1982? He said, I've said too much. So I started uh, Googling around to see crocodile Paris 1982. And it turns out they found uh, a crocodile uh, in the sewers near Pont Neuf, uh, firefighters found this crocodile. I found the old newspaper articles. Firefighters found the crocodile and sent it, like apparently it had been eating the rat population or something. They sent it off to a, a French zoo in the countryside. So I'm Googling French zoos, crocodile to see what comes up. And I get a hit that apparently had been sent to uh, Van in Brittany, V-A-N-N-E-S. I was like, oh, so that could have been a true story. And this is all on the show. I recorded it. I called the Van Aquarium and I said, um, hey, look, is it true that uh, in 1982 that uh, the Paris firefighters sent a crocodile to you? And the woman goes, uh, oh, you mean Eleanor? And I said, Eleanor? And she goes, yeah. And I said, what? Is she still there? Yeah, she's still there. She's 10 feet long and weighs however many hundreds of pounds it was. I only know it in kilograms, so sorry about that. Anyway, I went out and visited her and it became just my favorite story. Uh, the idea that there may be a crocodile or two swimming around in Paris and that there's a precedent and that it happened before. Uh, and that leads me, funnily enough, that story uh, leads me to uh, during the last lockdown, the first lockdown that we had in Paris, which was a year ago. And we were living, I was living with my wife in an apartment about as big as a shoebox. And we had, it was 57 days where we weren't allowed out except for exercise for an hour or to buy groceries. And I turned to my wife who's an illustrator and I said, um, she's a shoe designer as well. I said, what are we going to do to get us through this? And she said, I have no idea. And I said, let's turn the uh, crocodile story into a children's book. And uh, at the end of the lockdown, we produced it. And here it is, Kylie the Crocodile in Paris. And, uh, you know, that's kind of our way of turning the, the story into, you know, making it last forever. And I'm just going to show you inside it in the hope that if you guys know any children, it could be something that you buy for them one day or even today. Look, really kind of old school uh, vintage inspired pictures of Paris and the canal that you can see it there. And I wrote the text. It's all rhyming. Look, in a Paris canal at the edge of the town, a scaly old creature is swimming around. You might see, if you carefully stare for a while, her crocodile teeth and her crocodile smile. Anyway, if you guys like Paris, you'll see all kinds of, uh, the light's maybe not so good for showing it here. But you know, like the Cafe de Flore is in there. By, by day, kind of the crocodile goes through the sewers and explores all different parts of Paris. Anyway, look, I bet some of you guys recognize that place. Le Bon Marché. Jardin de Luxembourg, La Durée. Anyway, so it's based, so obviously it's based on a true story at the start. And then we imagine, look, there she is, buying the, uh, buying the crocodile at a Paris pet shop and then walking away with it. Anyway, there's the last picture I'm gonna show you. She grew too big, do you see? She grew too big for the fish tank, too big for the sink, too big for the bathtub, wouldn't you think? And then too big for the bathroom, too big for the hall. In each room she reached from the wall to the wall. Kylie the Crocodile. So there you go. There's a Paris story that I bet uh, most of you hadn't heard before. And uh, something fun that I just thought I'd share with you. Any questions about that before I catch my breath and we, and we move on? 
And the other thing I'll say is, uh, and this is totally by chance, is that um, today, the past 24 hours, I got a sale on all the books. So if at the end of this, you are even mildly interested in checking it out, it's uh, there. There's the link. No questions? I've got to raise my game a little bit with you guys, huh? Make you make, prompt some questions out of you. I'm just going to have a glass of water. Whew. Okay. Uh, why don't I talk a little bit as we're approaching the halfway point about, um, uh, in fact, Camille suggested at the start that I talk about how, um, you know, from a business perspective, how you can make a podcast survive through something like a lockdown when no one can go outside. Um, and it has been a little bit difficult, but there are ways to get creative. So um, one of the ways, like usually I go around, I interview people like the lady with the, with the crocodile or the beaver or whatever. But when you can't leave the house, it makes it a little bit difficult. So I got pretty creative during, during the first confinement. And I started not every week. In fact, not that much at all. But sometimes I interviewed famous dead Parisians by, uh, because over the years I've made friends with a lot of tour guides and actors in this city. I've, I've interviewed them before. And the tour guides often know the stories of these famous dead Parisians. Like I'm talking like Ernest Hemingway, for example, or Edith Piaf. And uh, they know their story so well that they could um, answer, you know, basic factual questions about them as if they were that person. So one way uh, that life was a little bit more fun for me during these, these horrible lockdowns was uh, I, do, I do interviews with Ernest Hemingway and I call it, I made, you know, obviously I can't interview Hemingway and everyone knows that it's not possible, but I, uh, I acted a little bit like I'd found some sort of time portal to 19, what would it have been, 1941 or something like that? 1945, I think we did with Ernest Hemingway, right after the Second World War had ended and he'd liberated the Ritz. And uh, I got this guy who is American to just act as Hemingway. And uh, I asked him all these questions about, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, he answered it. And it was really, it was really interesting because it was also, uh, <laughs> it was so different to what I usually do and a big risk because it's not a typical podcast episode. Uh, but I think it was uh, really worth a listen if you want to hear something really different. And then when the lockdown ended, I'm sure you guys have seen this movie or heard of this movie, Midnight in Paris. Uh, yeah, when it uh, ended, I went to the same steps that Owen Wilson sat on and I uh, just blatantly ripped off Woody Allen's idea there. And when the clock struck midnight, I had this friend of mine who's an actor impersonate Ernest Hemingway for an hour and we walked around the Latin Quarter and he, because he was a tour guide who knew Hemingway's life, you know, we walked past the door that he used to live in and all this kind of stuff. And he was talking about it like it was today. So uh, these are the ways that I had to get creative through the lockdown. But to sort of explain a little bit more, um, maybe I'll explain how a podcast, how I sort of turned a podcast that's free into a job. Because I think most people don't get it. In fact, it's the question that I get asked the most if I'm at like a wedding or whatever. This is how the conversation usually goes. So I assume some of you probably thought it already. If I meet someone, I say, I'm a podcaster. Sometimes they say, what's that? I say, it's like a radio show that's free to listen to whenever you want. And they go, this happens all the time. They go, ah, oh, yeah. Hey, you make money from that then. And then I explain it. And then uh, they, it always happens, actually. They ask more probing questions. You know, when people try and figure out your salary or whatever. And then it gets to a point where I want to go, so you're a doctor. What's your salary then? But I don't do it because I think it could, I don't know, that could be <laughs> divisive as well. I love that half of you guys laughed at that and half of you sort of shook your head. Maybe, maybe there are doctors in the room. I don't know. Uh, but let me tell you how I did it. Um, so you know as well is when... I started going full time on it. I knew there were listeners and fans like the guy that was in the coffee shop, for example, or the American woman whose mother was from New York and whose father was from the South. I knew she was a fan. I knew there were other fans and I, I thought of ways to do it. And there are only really two ways to make money from a podcast. One is you put adverts at the start. That's what most podcasts do. Podcasts that begin with, you know, buy a mattress or whatever, and it's really ugly and intrusive. And then the other thing uh, that people do is you have members, you know, like Netflix or Spotify or whatever. There's a website called Patreon. And what I really like about it is it's kind of like the old days in Paris when, um, you know, Picasso or Van Gogh or whatever, they had some rich patron who'd pay them a salary, basically. 
That doesn't work really nowadays, but what works instead is similar to Netflix, people um, sort of got a membership to the podcast. And the way I did it in the early days, someone who was it, Dorothy, that mentioned the videos. The way I did it in those really early days is I'd interview someone. So let's just say, I'll give you a perfect example because I did it last week. Uh, and this is a cool story too. Has anyone here been to the Chateau Vaux-le-Vicomte? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there, who is that waving? Alan and Jerry and JPJA Bart sort of waved like that. So I think that was, maybe you drove past it. Yeah, I think you drove past it. I don't really think you went in there. But um, I wrote a bucket list that I was talking to Camille about right before we started. A bucket list of things I wanted to do in Paris. Things I still want to do after sort of trying to explore as much as I could for six years. And on that list was um, visit this chateau. And I'm, now I realize that some of you haven't heard of it. The 32nd version of it is it was uh, built by the finance, uh, France's finance minister at the time of Louis XIV. And he built it so grand and so beautiful and so expensive that, uh, that Louis was infuriated, like infuriated. He went there for one party, looked around, he said, that's it, you're going to jail. He sent, and I'm doing the short version, but he sent the uh, owner who's Fouquet to jail where he spent the rest of his life. And then uh, Louis XIV got the same designer, gardener and artist behind it all and said, make something better. And that ended up being Versailles. So this place I went was like the basis of Versailles. And obviously that's the truncated version of, of the story or the shortened version of the story. Um, but I'd written on the bucket list that I wanted to visit this place and uh, this guy messaged me like two weeks ago. He goes, I love your uh, radio show, your podcast. Um, I see you want to go to Volvicomp. I know the owner. Uh, are you interested in meeting him? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Fouquet was the finance minister of Louis. Okay, not of France. Okay, it was a Fouquet was the finance minister of Louis. See, I, I was too quick with my details. So the owner was the finance minister to the king. Anyway, he built a beautiful chateau and uh, I said, I'd love to meet the owner. And then uh, the guy messaged back. He goes, he's expecting you. Call him. And I call the owner of this. And this chateau is just magnificent, just magnificent. And um, the owner says, uh, look, there's no tourists out here. If you want to come visit, you're welcome. And I said, I'm on the way. Like, let let's do it. He said, what do you want to see? I said, everything. And I was there like three days ago and I saw everything when it was closed and it was incredible. In fact, I'm gonna try and show you guys something. I don't know if it'll work, but if you guys check out my Instagram or Facebook channel, you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's a video that the owner took of me at his chateau with my wife next to me. I hope this works. Okay, you ready? You see this? So that was, okay, you get the picture, but that was us up on the top of that chateau and he got a drone and flew it all the way. It's like a one minute video. I'm not gonna show the whole thing. Anyway, the reason that I bring that up is twofold. Uh, one is, because uh, that's gonna be the podcast episode on Monday. If you guys wanna hear an interview with the chateau owner uh, and a fascinating story that goes with it. Uh, but two is, it's a really good explainer of how I made a career out of all this is every week, more or less, is I do a, a live video where I get the YouTube thing and it's just for the members. And with him, we walked around the garden and inside the chateau um, just for the members. So it's impossible if you're not a member to see it. If, you don't, if you're not in a position to be a member, you just listen to the free podcast and that's fine. But that's how I uh, turn it into a career because I was fortunate as it grew over the years, more people signed up. Oh, I'm getting uncomfortable. Ah, there you go. More people signed up and now it's a job and uh, now it's a company. The Earful Tower, S-A-S. -S. So uh, let me see the questions uh, while I have a little sip of water. So few questions, guys. Should I just keep talking at you? There's a question from Dorothy uh, saying... Oh. This, uh, I would just say, uh, since you talk about Kylie the Crocodile, maybe it's, uh, it would be also interesting if you talk about your second book and how you wrote it, since it's your first book. How was the process? Sure. I'm sorry if I cut you. You can answer the, the question, but I'm just saying to continue. I think it will be a good idea. I'm very grateful for that question, Camille. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and I'll also answer Dorothy's question because it's an easy one. How long can I stay in France as a tourist without getting a visa? If you're asking for yourself, Dorothy, I have absolutely no idea at all. Uh, I, I don't even know. 
I'm not an expert, but me personally, I can uh, stay here longer because my mother is British. So I have a European passport until a year ago when the Brexit vote meant that I don't have a European passport anymore, but I've figured that out. But I don't know how long you can stay here. I'm not very good with that kind of stuff. Hopefully longer than you think. And if you're asking for yourself, I hope you get to move here one day. Uh, as for uh, Camille's question, I realized I talked about a children's book. Maybe you guys don't even have any interest or care in a children's book, but I've got good news for you because uh, I wrote an adult's book too that, uh, that I tried to write what I, I describe myself <laughs> as a laugh out loud memoir. You know, with all the, I'll tell you a story from it, see if I make you laugh. Gosh, look at that. I'm challenging myself to see if I can make you guys laugh. Um, but it's a book I wrote. It's called Paris on Air. It's, it's basically, if you enjoyed the way I talked for the last 38 minutes, I think you'd enjoy the book. Is there anyone here that's already read it? Here's Wave. So, Jerry, I think you're a bit of a fan there, Jerry. Thank you. Alan, why did you not read it? Right there. Next. <laughs> Here's the book. It's called Paris on Air. That's me sitting there with a microphone next to the Eiffel Tower. You see, that's my face. This is a bestseller at Shakespeare and Company. So it's not just me uh, writing some rubbishy book trying to foist it upon you. This is a good book, I promise. And it, uh, it's just sort of like, you know, that uh, the story of the crocodile or the story of that chateau that I just told you. It's telling these stories of trying to uncover France. Obviously, the chateau one's not in it because that happened two days ago. Uh, but it's those kind of things. And... Uh, and seeing you guys are all language students, I'll tell you of one of my language faux pas that ended up in the book. And I'm going to watch to see if you laugh. And if you don't, that's all right. But I, I'm walking the plank here a little bit. So let's see how we go. Um, uh, and it's a true story. So I play basketball. And uh, I think I'm all right at basketball. I think I'm a decent enough player that could walk onto a court anywhere in the world and say, hey, can I play and to be good enough to hold my own, right? And that's important. That's not me bragging. That's to set the scene. So I was in the, uh, the once again, I was in the Murray district and there was this outdoor basketball court. And I walked up and asked if I could play with these guys, street ball. And uh, that, in all honesty, like when you're learning, I assume a lot of you guys are learning French. Like when you're learning French or any language and you put yourself in these difficult positions, like, you feel like a child, like go up and say, hey, can I play with you guys? Like it was, it was quite a big deal for me, even though I played basketball my whole life. Anyway, fortunately they welcomed me and it was through these guys that I learned no end of slang. Like they all spoke slang. These guys were kind of like, they were kind of like wannabe Americans, you know, they played American rap music. They, uh, they, they only really spoke in slang. And, and that was how I learned a lot of French, including slang. So uh, one example that I found really interesting is the way that they had like 50 words for in English, in American English for like, like a uh, dude, like, hey dude, you know? So the most common word uh, that they ever said was mech, M-E-C. They say it all the time, salu mech, all the time. And then, uh, so I said it too, and I quite like it. I still say it, I like the word. You wouldn't use it at, you know, ordering from a waiter in uh, the Ritz, but you would use it on a basketball court, or I would anyway. Anyway, the more I went down there to play every week, the more words I learned, slang, and these other words for dude cropped up. So for example, pot, P-O-T-E, pot, uh, uh, grand, like big. And so they'd say, salut mon grand. They put mon at the front. So the same way in America, you say like, hey, what's up, my man? You know, salut mon grand, salut mon pote. And uh, all these kind of different words. And I learned lots of them. Bro, they even say bro, salut mon pro. And uh, I used them all with abandon. I thought it was quite fun. Uh, what I didn't realize is that you couldn't say salut mon mec, right? You can say salut mon grand, salut mon pote. You can say salut mec. But for some stupid reason, you can't say salut mon mec. But I said it to everybody all the time, not thinking anything of it. Same as all of you guys who don't know where this is going. Didn't think about it until I emailed it to this French guy one day who was coming in to meet me in the studio. I said, uh, bonjour mon mec, I'll see you at four o'clock, whatever. And he responded, no, he called me. And he said, um, whoa, whoa, whoa what, why did you write that? And I said, what? He said, mon mec. And I said, why, what's wrong with that? He says, mon mec literally means my darling. I was like, what do you mean? He says, you can say mon pote, mon bro, mon grand. 
But once you say mom mec, it means my darling. And I paused and realized that for the previous two months, at least I've been walking out the length of the basketball court, giving the high five and the fist to everybody and saying, hello, my little darling, or hello, my love uh, to all of them. And none of them had ever corrected me. So, uh, it's a minefield out there and be careful when you try and use slang. And if I can recommend anything, it's to steer clear of words like uh, mech and more mech. Otherwise you might fall into the same potholes as I did, but there you go. There's my story. I I'm glad to see that a few of you giggled because I, uh, I really, I really, uh, I really promised a lot there, but look, those are the kind of stories that the book is about. It's about how I moved here and tried to fit in and uh, sort of, I think sort of made a good go of it. And there's another good chapter, I realize there's no one's uh, put any comments. And I'm going to switch it to a comments thing for the last 15 minutes and we can have a chat and you can unmute yourself to ask them. But I'm going to also share um, the brief version, especially if you guys don't care that much about Paris. Uh, the reason that there's this red scooter on the front here is because uh, when I got married to my wife, we, uh, I have this little red scooter that I drive around town that goes 30 miles an hour. And for our honeymoon, we spent two and a half months driving 3,000 miles around the entire country of France. And I mean the entire country. If France is like this, we, we I'm not going to spoil it in the book, but we did uh, basically along all the coastline, which means that you go through uh, like Brittany and, uh, you know, down La Rochelle, La Rochelle, Ile de Ré, Marseille, Carcassonne, Carcassonne, Marseille, Bordeaux and then up like uh, Ansi and so on and meeting people all the way and learning French and uh, uh, the way that people speak in South, uh, the Southwest for anyone here from the Southwest of France is a little bit different to uh, the way they speak in Paris. But anyway, uh, that's a fun chapter, I think in the book, if you're not such of a Paris fan, there's something in there for you. And before I switch over to Q and A, as we, I realize we have 15 minutes left, um, I'd like to make a little offer for you guys. It feels like one of those TV programs where they make offers. But uh, all the stock I have of these books are in the US. You guys are in uh, New York. I don't have books in New York, but I got them pretty close by in several states. And if I say, let's say before midnight, on that, sh on that uh, midnight Paris time, that link I sent you, the earfultower.com slash shop, I'm gonna check it as we talk. There's an offer where you can get both books really cheap if you pick them up in Paris, as in, as in no postage, you guys can get it on that uh, link and I'll send it to you for free postage. So 40 euros, whereas it'd usually be 50. And I'm looking at it there. It says pick up in big letters on the earfultower.com slash shop as my way of saying thanks for listening to me. Um, there you go. Questions now. This is great. There's lots of questions coming in. What JPJA bar, is that a name, JP? JP, do you want to ask it out loud so I can hear your voice? Yeah, I'm here. You want to hear my French voice? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what is the reaction of Parisians when you tell them you're from Australia? Do they have any idea where Australia is? Is your name Jean-Pierre, by the way? Yes. Nice to meet you, Jean-Pierre. Um, nice people, to meet you, Oliver. Thank you. People love... Australia. I'm not even kidding. It's always a really positive reaction. Everybody knows where it is because uh, I'll tell you how the typical conversation goes. I could almost script it is people say they hear my accent when I speak French. My French is pretty good, but there's an accent and they go, uh, they go, vous venez d'où? And I say, oh, je suis Australien. And they say, oh, oui, mon uh, cousin habite uh, en Australie, mais... That's how it always goes. So they say that they have a cousin or a nephew or something in Australia, but they never know the city. And then they often say to me, uh, when I say I live in Paris, they say, why do you live in Paris when you could live in Australia? <laughs> it's the same. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a script. And, and my wife, who's Swedish, because you often have these kind of ta conversations in taxis or with waiters or whatever, you know, like that really brief sort of small talk. They always mention Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who's a soccer player, who went to play in LA actually, but that, that's the connection with, uh, you know, once it was probably ABBA, now it's this soccer player. And for me, it's just, what are you doing here? But uh, no, people know where it is. So um, that's a good sign. Thanks for the question, Jean-Pierre. Gina Dietrich, 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 Dietrich. Hey Gina, how you doing? 
She's good. Okay. Did I ever take four? <laughs> I'm French good. Class? Thank you. <laughs> hey, nice to hear from you, Gina. Um, I did take formal French classes. I took it. I studied at university. I studied at high school. And when I moved, and then I moved to Sweden for five years and I learned Swedish very fluently, like very good Swedish. And I forgot pretty much everything, honestly. Um, and then when I started in, uh, moved to Paris, I had a job where I had to speak. There's a lot about this in the book, actually the nerves of speaking, especially I had to call people and interview them about very sensitive things. Like, oh, like I remember one, I didn't talk about this in the book, but I remember one horrible, like, uh, like there'd been terror attacks and uh, the boss asked me to go and interview Muslims about how they felt people were treating them because a lot of, there was a lot of anti-Muslim hate. And I had to go and interview Muslims about how they felt about that. And my French was atrocious. And it was so sensitive and I felt, I just felt horrible doing it. Like it was horrible, um, which isn't what you asked, but it's getting to it. Uh, when he realized how bad my French was, he made me take French classes and I went to study in Paris for a while. Mm. But unlike Alliance Francaise, I'm sure in Paris, the teachers are horrible. And I hear it's a way that French people teach children in general, which maybe Camille and Jean-Pierre can comment on, but the teacher, and this I talked about in the book, the teacher would mock me when I didn't know something. So he'd say, um, you know, what's the subjunctive here? Oliver. And I'd be like, oh, je ne sais pas. And he'd go, oh, tu ne sais pas, Oliver. And I'd be like, oh, it's not encouraging me. So I quit. And then I learned street French on the basketball court. <laughs> So I speak all right French, but I could easily get tripped up on something that someone who studies it properly uh, would think is really easy. But like, I'm very confident, like, you know, if I had to call up and do taxes or something like that, I could do it. But uh, I would never win any awards and I wouldn't want to go like live on TV. In fact, France 24 came and interviewed me during the lockdown because me and my wife were doing pub quizzes. Every week on YouTube, we do this pub quiz. And he interviewed me in, in English because they have the English channel. And then he said, let's do it in French too for the French channel. And he switched to French and he asked the first question and I started talking. And then he's like, you know what? I'll just put subtitles over you. I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, I think it was partly because I was nervous to be talking to the national news channel. But a uh, good long answer for a short question. I have taken um, really proper classes and my French is pretty good. How about that? Um, Sounds good. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Jean-Pierre said, any fun reaction? Was that perhaps re referring to the joke that I did and whether people laughed? Is that what it was? Uh, and Dorothy, what's your favorite Aaron Dismont and why? I just moved to the seventh Aaron Dismont and I'm exploring it like crazy. And I think it's really interesting. And uh, it's my currently, it's my favorite. It's big and unusual. And I lived in Montmartre for the previous two years. So it's so different. Also, something I didn't talk about at all is uh, my wife's expecting a baby any day now. So uh, my whole life in Paris is very quickly set to change. And I'm excited to be living in the seventh because I don't know if you guys know Paris very well, but the sidewalks are way bigger here. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a lot easier for pushing a pram around, especially compared to our last place in Montmartre, which had no elevator and we were on the fifth floor. So uh, <laughs> I think we're, we're in for a treat. So that's uh, something uh, probably for another book, I think. What else have we got? Did JP have his hand up? You can unmute. Oh, no, Sandy Goodman. Let's go with you, Sandy. Yes, this is not really a question. It's more of a comment and then a question for everyone. Um, I went on a tour of Paris, and it was focusing on Papa Hemingway and all the places he stayed at. And... Um, so that was really interesting. And it was in June and the average temperature was going to be 70 Fahrenheit, but it happened to be, it happened to be 95 and it just was, there was no air conditioning and it just was too much for me. Um, and the other, and the other people, and it, it, I'm a Francophile, but it kind of turned me off, you know, and I don't understand uh, why, I mean, I know it's an energy thing, but I think it's, you have to live. So it was very hard um, to like go and view places. And we also had actors come and, you know, Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda and Hemingway. So what do people think about that type of, of, of why there is an air conditioning and 
What's their opinion? I think personally, I think it's just because the buildings here are so old and there's no mm -hmm. room for, for the air conditioning. But it's not that often it gets extremely hot here, you know, like, uh, I think it's, uh, but I think it's mostly because the buildings are so old, like some of them are hundreds of years old. There are buildings here that are older than any building in uh, where I come from. So mm -hmm. I that. And it can be quite difficult when it's really hot, but fortunately, it's not like that very many days of the year. But thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. And I see another question from Jean-Pierre. Felicitation, is it a mech? Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that uh, it's going to be a surprise for everyone, except me and my wife. We found out by uh, my French mistake to the doctor. I, I don't want to reveal a story because I really want to use it in my next book. But I said something wrong and the doctor interpreted it as me asking for the gender. And the doctor told me. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. So uh, we know the gender and we're very excited about it. You'll find out in a couple of days if you're following along. <laughs> I think we have time for another question or two. And then I'm going to leave you to the lovely weather that I hear New York has today. Mm -hmm. Who have we not heard from? Some people not. Uh, Oliver, what I wanted to ask, maybe it's going to interest other people, is that uh, since, since Paris is known to be about restaurants and culture, How can you find other activities now with everything closed? Maybe if interest for yeah, other yeah. people? That's a great question. Me and uh, my wife are talking about this today, actually, is because everything is like really closed. The only thing you can do is go to a, uh, like a coffee shop and buy a coffee from the door or a restaurant and buy the food. Like, mm -hmm. You can't go into mm -hmm. that. So it's become really highly um, valuable to go for a walk, an exploratory walk. And uh, I talked about this on the podcast really recently, like the 16th hour on this one, which is chic and expensive and residential and has always been really boring to me, has suddenly become really interesting because it's really nice to walk around and just look in the, um, like looking through the glass doors to these lobbies, like these pictures I should show you, pictures of these beautiful, like these beautiful mosaic floors on the, on the, like the lobbies, right? These kind of things that, you know, if there was a museum open, you can get something better in a museum, you know, but if you've got nothing else to do, going for a walk in a place with magnificent architecture suddenly becomes the best thing. So I think the answer is that walking has just become way more important part of life and exploring in that way. And uh, we all know that the museums are going to open up really soon. So we can, uh, we can count on that happening soon, but you know, parks and walking basically is it. Check this out. Can you guys see this? That's a mosaic of a tiger eating a deer or something. That's huge. That's the size of, you know, if I laid down like the Vitruvian man, I couldn't reach all the edges of that. And that's just in a 16th uh, arrondissement apartment. So it's all about the walking. And if you uh, enjoy exploring like that, I share those pictures all the time on Facebook and Instagram, which is free and fun to follow. And I think if you've enjoyed this talk, you'll enjoy those channels. One last question to finish before I do one last plug for my book. Come on, give me a hard question. Make me squirm. There you go. At the top there, Alice. This is like going all the way back to the beginning of the event. Um, but why did you decide to move to Paris in the first place? And like uh, you said, you had studied French in university, but you still weren't like that good at French. And like, I'm just wondering what made you make that leap? I sense deep down you want to move to Paris. <laughs> yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> yeah. um, I did too. I always had been interested in it in the back of my head. And uh, I moved to Sweden and uh, I had no reason to stay in Sweden anymore. Uh, and then a job opportunity came up at the same company I was working for in the Paris office and I applied for it. And I was like, I'm going to do it. I had no connection to the city at all. Nothing. Didn't know anyone. Didn't have an apartment. In fact, that's how the book starts. I knew nothing. I knew nothing and no one. And I got, uh, I applied for the job and they said, do you speak French? I was like, really well. Uh, and I said, <laughs> I said, if not, I'll learn it really quickly. Look, I speak Swedish. It can't be that hard. And it was that hard. And, uh, and then I got an apartment really like in the second hour of this month, which I didn't even know what that meant. Like I just went on a one-way ticket. I wanted to start something new. I had no girlfriend, no, 
nothing. And so I just was like, take the plunge. I was at an age where I thought I could get away with it and I did it and it was the best thing I ever did. It's just great. So um, I didn't have any real reason. I definitely didn't speak good enough French. I didn't have any strong contacts. The job even I was desperately underqualified for. I even said to him, I was like, I'll journalism, I'll, I'll learn whatever I don't know, I'll learn in one month. And that was so wrong too, I'm still learning. So um, if you're thinking to do it, and that's why you asked me, just take the plunge, just do it. It would be the best thing that you ever did, but it's hard. It's definitely not easy. Yeah. Um, I've actually, so I lived in France before. I lived in France for like eight months. And then um, I also studied in Paris before that. Um, cool. But yeah, living. You probably speak better French than I did. You'll be fine. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I yeah. hope it works out. Um, and then there was one more. Was it Lena, did you say? The American Lena? Is that no, Jean Pierre's? Actually, I have a different question I'd rather ask. You mentioned before the Shakespeare bookstore. And I know in the time several months ago, they talked about the store having problems, but then not having problems because of uh, people buying over the internet. I was just wondering how the bookstore was doing. Uh, they did they're doing well. In fact, they so they were struggling and then they launched some member program similar to the kind of member program I have actually. And uh, like, it was funny because the books that I made are both self published, right? And uh, when I take them, I took them into Shakespeare and Company because they wanted it. And I, uh, it's not a good deal for me, you know, because Shakespeare and Company takes a cut, but I love that shop and I wanted to support them. So during the, uh, when they were struggling, I donated a box of books. I was like, take them, sell them. I hope you can make some money. And uh, fortunately for them and for me, it sold like crazy. So they kept getting more in. But I think Shakespeare and Company uh, is probably struggling a lot less than some of the other bookshops in Paris because they've got such a huge, Natalie Portman was promoting them the other day, mm. you know? And there are like five-ish English language bookshops in Paris. So I think Shakespeare's doing fine. Uh, I think they continue to do fine with staff on partial furlough and so on. But the online orders, are, they're taking them. You can get both those books there if you want, uh, if you want to support them. And they got a membership program, but they're doing fine. I wouldn't worry too much about Shakespeare and Company. They got, I, got, I think they got friends in high places. But having said that, I love that they're stocking my books. So uh, if you want to... Get them online there, go for it. But anyway, look, I think uh, I think you guys would all rather be in the sunshine than hearing me babbling on about my life in Paris. But I will finish on this note if I can be permitted. Um, if you found this talk even mildly amusing, you will like the children's book and the adult's book. I'll send them to you in the same envelope or one or the other on that website that I shared before, the earfultower.com slash shop. If you get it, before I go to bed, basically, which will be at about midnight, I'll send it to you on that Paris pickup price, which is 10 euros cheaper. What's that, like $15 cheaper? Postage is on me uh, for both books or either. The uh, children's book's on sale today anyway. So uh, I'll leave it with that. If you uh, don't want the books and don't care, I would humbly and kindly ask you to check out the podcast. Even if you're not a podcast person, just find a way to follow it, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, get in the world. And as the podcasts come along, especially the Chateau one that's coming on Monday with uh, Jean-Michel de, de Vougoui, that is a really cool episode to listen to. And I think it'll be a really nice way for you to check out some of the, the, you know, the work that I do. And then lastly, if you've uh, enjoyed this so much that you go, I just want more from this. I want to see him thrive. I want to help him uh, to grow to new heights. Check out Patreon, which is where for that small monthly membership, you go way deep behind the scenes. And uh, for example, you will unlock those videos that I did at the uh, Chateau Vaux-le-Vicomte. So you'll be able to watch the replays. You'll see it like you've never seen it before. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So I'm sharing the link to that too. And I think when we close the chat, they'll disappear. But there they are, theeiffeltower.com slash shop, patreon.com slash theeiffeltower. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks for your lovely questions and uh, your lovely faces. I'll see you next time I'm in Westchester, I guess. Thank you, Oliver, for everything. And goodbye, everybody. Thanks for having me, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Merci. Thank you, Oliver. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.